Hello. Uh, we will continue our discussion on uh, performance appraisal. In the last lecture on performance appraisal, I was giving you some of the details of uh, what are the purposes and what are the various issues with respect to the performance appraisal. We have seen performance appraisal in the overall context of human resource management and how human resource management has to deliver a value to the organization. And performance appraisal is a, an important tool in the hands of the managers to understand the needs of the individual on the one hand and meet the organizational expectations on the other. And that is how performance appraisal is considered as a matching process, matching between the individual and the organization. Today we will continue to look into the other dimensions of uh, performance appraisal and at the end of this session I want you to see various methods of uh, performance appraisal, various components of uh, performance appraisal and also the what are the benefits of performance appraisal at the, to the individual, to the group and to the organization. You will also recognize some of the common mistakes the errors which will creep into the performance appraisal system. When we are thinking of various methods, as we have already covered the basic objectives and various methodologies, if you see the grading method, the basic approach in grading method is to consider all the features, all the aspects of the individual and grade them means arrange them, rank them from one level to the other. So that means given four employees, given five employees working under you, how would you place them? Who is the best? Who is the next best? Who, you could, who would be the, at the lowest level? So what is important is that the manager here considers the aspects like attendance, appearance, the overall uh, cooperative attitude exhibited by the employee, uh, the concern for quality, the responsiveness to the others and colleagues in the organization. So most of the dimensions are taken together. And then in the grading method, the, the appraiser, the boss would uh, rank the, or they put them into different slots. So in terms of this, if you see, the certain categories are of criteria need to be established at the beginning and also must be well defined so that others can also respond to the grading method. So the features one can see, one can assess could vary from one organization to the other, from one superior to the other, but it is desirable to list out some of the common things. It could be the analytical ability the ability to analyze, understand problem, generating alternatives, choosing some of the best of the alternatives and things like that, the cooperativeness, the dependability, when you give this or it gives some, give some task to the individuals, then whether they are in a position to deliver <coughs> with or without supervision. So without supervision indicates more dependability. Then the self-expression, the individual is able to express and convey his or her ideas to the others. The job knowledge and the judgment what one would bring to the table, leadership and organizing ability. So one can consider various dimensions of this and then it is uh, it could be done in the kind of, in if you see uh, this kind of a grading is useful at the end of the exams, people are given A grade, B grade, C grade and things like that. It is also possible that you do not see them in kind of a percentage of marks, but you group them into set of categories. Some are excellent, some are uh, good or very good, poor and things like that. So a qualitative 
or a letter kind of a grade or a descriptive kind of a grade can be identified a priori and the individuals are assigned based on the set of criteria, based on the observation, based on the inputs, based on the kind of performance, they can be classified, they can be put into one or the other grade. The other thing is in terms of the graphic uh, rating scale, rating scale uh, would involve <coughs> identifying the, the various shades of the kind of things what we considered earlier whether the job knowledge or the ability to do the performance or the ability to do the task, responsibility for things, responsibility for people and things like that. But they are recorded on a scale, scale of A, B, C, D, E, F could be or it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1 meaning could be very low and 5 meaning could be very high. So, a rating scale is provided for each of the items and it is seen as higher the rating you can see on various dimensions like what I mentioned job knowledge, responsibility, uh, punctuality, things like that. The individual can be rated and the based on the ratings you can see somebody as very good or otherwise. But this is one of the oldest and widely used technique and uh, it is deployed in most of the organizations in different ways and different formats. So, it could be the self rating or it could be the rating by the bosses or it could be the rating by the immediate boss or by the colleagues, things like that. The other important thing could be a forced choice kind of a description method. In this you describe all the qualities, but then you have to describe who is more this or who is less of that. For example, if you take in a group, okay, who is much more articulated? So, given the two individuals, who is more articulated? Given the two individuals, who is more emotional? Given the two, who is more committed? So, in other words, what you are trying to do is take set of qualities and then in a forced choice, you try and push into the one or the other category. So, normally there is no third choice or a fourth choice within the given choice one has to one has to push the subordinates into the appropriate positions. So, the first choice is each group consists of four descriptive statements concerning employees behavior. So, the, the two statements could be most descriptive in terms of the favorable and two are least descriptive or could be done favorable. So, within the group, group of people, then you would see who would fit into which of the, which of the groups. It could also be there as a kind of a checklist when you try and do this in a way the reader evaluates the, the overall things, does not, you know, evaluate employees performance, but then you have uh, details, you have the details about what that person does or per person may not do on the task. For example, does he keep all his uh, uh, work area clean and proper? Does he keep all the tools well organized? Before leaving the work, does he clean up, keep everything as it was before? So, many of these things can be put as a kind of a checklist and then as long as the person is, you are able to take, they can, you can assume that the performance is satisfactory or excellent. It could be seen for some of the routine task. It may be about the cleaning of a particular floor, maintenance of many of the machines and areas. What is required is a checklist is put there so that the individual does that kind of a task, signs and goes. I think when wherever you can see routine tasks, standardized tasks, periodic things could it, it is uh, to be done, then the checklist could be one of the one of the best methods. And as long as everything has been done and signed and then it can see the, the performance is at the correct level or good level or somebody has not done. So, a series of questions regarding the employees and his behavior. So, then you know the rater can also do that kind of a check indicating if the answer to a question about an employee is positive or negative 
if the rating has to be done by the bosses. So, it could be a good thing for a self, it, you know the way the individual himself or herself is uh, doing the, the checking as well as it could be from the bosses where they can run through all the questions and then they can say yes or no or to some degree whether the individual is performing or not. But the question is that the each of these items, each of the aspects must be weighed equally or certain questions may be given more weight come depending on the task, but most of the time there are not much of a weightage or the weights are given between the questions. And uh, so it could, it could be very clearly some of the desirable aspects of the question, that the employee uh, enjoys his job or not, interested in his job or not. So such questions can be can be a part of this kind of a checklist. And then you know the other important thing is about, about a methodology many people have found it very, very useful is a critical incident method. The critical incident method, the supervisor continuously records the, the various uh, important events uh, of the employee, both positive and negative systematically in a book, maybe a left side all uh, you know not so good things and on the right side all the good things. For example, around 5.30 I had a very urgent work to be completed. So I asked this employee, but he said no, 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 he has to do some work, he has, he has something else and he walked out. Another situation could be that and a very, very urgent work to be done, but this employee seeing my uh, concern and seeing my pressure, he came and he took initiative and he did all the things. He ensured that I completed all my tasks and supported fully, even though I have not requested him to do anything. And he went out of the way to meet my requirements. So, like this, there could be many things could be happening in the job, you know, on the job, in the organization, something very positive, something very negative or not so appropriate or very appropriate kind of a behavior. Some are very proactive, some are very reactive. What is the idea of the supervisor is to record some of these incidents, write down as it happens so that when he sits for a discussion with his or her subordinate, then you, you know, it becomes very easy. It becomes data based, it becomes mutually verifiable and both can discuss and agree upon, yes, certain positive things have been done or something more could have been done and clearly see what that in, you know, the person should do. So the each employee behavior is noted and then these notes would help and the superior rates the performance based on this kind of a notes taken. So the notes will guide the, the kind of judgment so that the individual is taking overall picture of the subordinates performance and the behavior and an agreement or disagreement should be possible because then the subordinate can say, I think, sir, you are over interpreting my reaction on that day. Don't you know I had such and such a pressure? Or don't you know that I have a, a nailing parents at home? Or don't you know that my wife is in the hospital? So many of these things they can ask and verify. The other important method one can think of is the group appraisal method. So under this method, employees are rated by a set of uh, appraisers. So that means a set of people would consisting of the not only the immediate boss but several of them and then together they come to a judgment. Sometimes it is the immediate boss, the HR and the heads of some of the other departments. So in other words, what could happen is these people, the particularly the subordinate, may be doing the kind of tasks where several people receive the services. It could be the cash section or it could be the materials uh, department and uh, it would be, it's always nice 
where a set of people take a notice of this particular department and also the person in charge of such department. And then so multiple judges discuss and come to some conclusion. It is also possible that some of the methodology is called as a field review method. Under this method, a trainer employs work from the personal department and the, you know, but interview with the line uh, supervisors. And the line supervisors evaluate the respective uh, subordinates. So that means, you know, they together, they work and then uh, explore different things. So the trainer is fully equipped with the definite test questions. So the questions are asked and answered verbally. And then, uh, you know, the, the final thing is based on your one's performance. So the success depends upon that kind of an interview. This method is adopted where appraisal or the appraisee provides all the details to the appraisal process or the set of people who are involved. First they go through the report, but then the questions, answers and the dialogues would decide whether the individual knows and in the what individual has done in the past few years. Another method very widely used and historically very well established is a kind of a free form essay method. In this method, the manager writes a short essay describing each employee's performance during the rating period. And the, he analyzes the important uh, goals set for the employee, employee or the subordinate and what that employee has done or has not done in terms of the giving the best of the effort and whether the individual has pursued the task very clearly or not and then how are he how he or she went about looking into the task and the the exact deliverables and what is that person has achieved and what is that he or she should have achieved taking into consideration all the details of the circumstances i think that that gives a kind of a picture, not only for the boss, also to the subordinate. But free form as a matter is one such thing where the, where the overall performance is measured based on the strengths and weaknesses of the employee and also the specific uh, activities of the individual. But don't, the emphasis is not on various aspects of the job dimension. So in this kind of a situation, it is possible that the rater may rate the employee at a higher or at the lower end because one can give a lot of reasons, explanations and things like that. Whereas in the scale, there is not much of a scope to do or give any of those explanations. But compared to this, force distribution method would be a better because then the rater has not much of a choice. He has to push the individual. So some organizations believe force distribution method is better, particularly employed or identifying who are the top performers and who are the bottom level performers. Force distribution requires very clearly to spread their employee evaluation and in a prescribed distribution, possibly it is called a 10, 70, 20 or it could be 20, 70 and 10, uh, depending on, but typically it is a 10 percent top performers, 70 percent in the middle and 20 percent at the bottom. However, one cannot, you know, remove the role of the appraisers in this whole process. And so that is how the, the criticisms about the appraisal process as well, where it was described as very subjective and not so data based, not much where you can really verify the, do, the contributions of the employees. So the, the paradigm shifted towards about the delivery, about the results of what one has done rather than what one is. So arguments were, were put forth, people talked about that you must give less emphasis to the personality, you should give less emphasis to the behavior, but really focus on 
the results and what the individual has done towards achieving the goals of the organization. I think that's the time where people started talking about the appraisal by results or by management by objectives. This really took off in uh, late 80s and 90s. Several organizations worked through this process of management by objectives. In short, it is called as MBO, has been evolved by Peter Drucker, and many interventions were, were planned in different sectors, both public sector, or private sector, medium-sized organization, and all of them felt that the MBO is a very, very powerful philosophy of managing and then making sure that the end results are achieved. So that means it is the best way of operationalizing the set goals and then through a proper discussion, through a dialogue, both boss and subordinate agree and then that could be the basis of assessment. And that is how MBO can be defined as a process whereby the superior and subordinate manager of an organization jointly, I think this word is important, identify their common goals. That means the subordinate perceives what are the tasks before the boss and then they define each individual's major areas and what are, what are the areas in which one should be doing and contributing and putting set of measures. Assessment center method is another way of doing the appraisals. I'm mentioning here at this as we are discussing the performance appraisal, the assessment center method is used both at the selection stage as well as a method for the development of the individuals. It is quoted basically it was applied in uh, German army in 1930s but in the system of or an organization where assessment of several individuals is done by various experts, but basically psychologists using various techniques. So when you see this assessment center method, it uh, is elaborate and then uh, various departments are brought together to spend two or three days working on an individual or group assignment. Sometimes they are given tasks to work as individuals and present case studies their oral and written uh, communication skills are assessed. Sometimes two individuals are asked to work together in dyads so or triads where the three, three persons work together and also the several group activities. And when group assignments are done, you observe what the individual or the individual is doing and how they organize, how he is putting all the thoughts together Things like that, both at the individual as well as at the group level can be explored. So the, the question is that when to deploy this kind of an assessment center. Most of the time the assignments are, are deployed at the time of uh, promotion and also reviewing a substantial work assignment around the, the capacities. So both as a uh, potential appraisal tool as well as performance appraisal tool. So the kind of activities listed under assessment center methods are called the leaderless group discussion where no agenda gets, you know, gets defined but the group is asked to define a task and work around that. Sometimes it is also the structured group discussion. In a structured group discussion, the problem is common to all the individuals and the solutions and the solution methodologies are different for each of the group members. And then you will see how they go through their solutions, put their arguments across. Let me give you one example. It is called a college case. In a college case, all the balance sheet information, when it was established, the current issues, many of these things are presented as a background material to the each of the participants and the assessors would watch what each one of them would do. So along with the common information, solutions are different for each one of them. 
So typically in an assessment center about 6 participants are taken and 2 to 3 observers would observe their activities, their contributions. In that kind of a situation the solutions could be that the college has to increase resources. One solution is double the classroom strength. Another solution could be that work in double shift. Another solution could be that create more sections or more, you know, more in parallel <coughs> classrooms and sessions. Or it could be that retire all senior people, hire more part-time and young people so that the salary cost can be cut down. Or it could be the solution that create uh, more benefit matches using the students and collect money, the get more donations from the public. So the solutions could vary. No doubt the problems of the organization, you, you know, the as given to all of them would be to raise more resources and make it more effective. So then you will observe how each of the participants would perceive the problem and argue with others, convince others, and then come up with a proper solution. So in an assessment center, typically the observers would see and they come to a judgment based on the observable behaviors. So analytical skills, analysis, and organizing abilities are more assessed based on the observable, what one can see the behaviors in a half a day or a day or two days depending upon the, the design of the assessment center. The other broad thing is to see the human asset accounting methodology or also called as the human resource accounting. So it deals with the cost and contribution of human resource to the organization overall and make uh, a broad assessment of how many how much of the contribution has come from the existing human resource compared to whatever of the past year. So additional turnover, additional uh, productivity improvements, you partialize for the human efforts and human contribution. So the cost of the employee which you one can take can include manpower planning, recruitment, selection, training, placement, everything the direct and the indirect benefits and then <coughs> the, the cost of the human resource uh, then is considered as a standard the, and then you know employee performance cost and then we will compare to the number of employees. So if you see that per employee turnover should be about 27 lakhs that is how if you see and then for every addition employee what is happening and one can compare with this kind of a benchmark. So then if such kind of a contribution is not coming, then you see that employee performance is lacking somewhere. So employee costs in relation to the total employee turnover is a kind of an accounting uh, kind of a methodology. The other could be the behavioral anchor rating scales. Very simple, simple to develop, simple to apply, However, many find it difficult to arrange the rating scales in terms of effective and ineffective behaviors. But if you see the behavioral anchor rating scale method, the combined elements of the traditional rating scales as well as the critical incident method. The example could be many, but what is important is first to identify major job and job components. Let's say that there is a billing clerk employed in a uh, supermarket. So then first we will see that is a, how he collects, organizes the articles before hands it over to the customer. So some may put everything together, a smelly item, there is some frozen uh, ice cream, then uh, some hot things, uh, vegetables, and then toiletries. If somebody uh, clubs everything and builds and packs it, I think then you know it is a very, very ineffective behavior. The other side of the effective behavior is as he receives the items, first he classifies into the ma major classes 
and systematically he does the billing and puts it into the respective packet and then hands it over to the customer. The smelly ones, the frozen ones, things like that. I think then it indicates an effective uh, behavior. The question is in behavioral anchor rating scale, identify some of those dimensions, identify the specific behaviors which can be arranged from most effective to most ineffective. I think such initiatives would help in uh, arranging and assessing who is contributing and who is not contributing. So the what we really have to think about is the various other ways of examining the performance appraisal process. I think five questions are important. The who of the appraisal, the what of the appraisal, which I have discussed many of this, when of the appraisal, the where of the appraisal, and the how of the appraisal. I think if, if we can answer most of these questions, then probably it is, you know, we will get an overall appreciation of this whole process. The question which I have already answered in several ways, but I want to bring this to the focus. The who, who should be the, the who should be rated and uh, who should do the rating. I think that's what is the, the who of the appraisal. And we have heard these terms earlier because of the the what one should do in terms of the who of the appraisal is that the issue is that all employees of an organization should be appraised. Question is from right from the operator to the top level of the management. But for one reason or the other, whatever may be their contribution, that must be assessed. So the question is who we know in terms of the who should be appraised, that all should be appraised. Now the question is on the appraiser, who should do the rating kind of a thing. It could be starting, the, uh, the starting point could be the self, what we call as a self appraisal. It is possible that the self and the boss would do the together this appraisal. Sometimes it is desirable that boss and the subordinate also use others in the organization. So when you see the who of the appraisal, we hear this term called the 360 degree appraisal. So the 360 degree appraisal is that not only the self, the boss, but also the colleagues in the organization and also the customers and other uh, stakeholders of the job also assess. So the, the best thing is the the multi appraisals are fine, but the self appraisal could be the starting point. Now the next question comes, again we have reviewed this, is the what of appraisal. So on what, what should be considered? So the performance appraisal consists of appraising, you know, it is non-supervisory employees, definitely for their current performance. and. As you go up in the organizational hierarchy, it is the managers for their future potential. So it, it is not that it is zero or hundred percent of this, but it is a, it is, it is the matter of degree. So it starts from the current performance at the lowest level, what are their routines, what they are doing, to as you see, as you see mm, people at the higher level. The idea is not only what they have done, but what is that they will do. So it is the question of assessing performance as well as potential. And it includes evaluation of sometimes the human traits. So that means it is not only the, the behaviors, the results, as well as the kind of traits what they bring to the table. So the traits, the attitudes, the behaviors, the results all are to be examined, all are to be assessed by the, in the appraisal process. Now the next important question comes the why of appraisal. We have talked about performance appraisal based on the objectives or the concepts of the MBO where the boss and subordinate sit together 
work on their objectives, review it together, see their contribution, learning from each other, rework on their priorities. So all that has happened as a part of the appraisal by objectives or MBO. But now when we look at the why of appraisal, one need to see it defined very clearly what is that you want to achieve. One of the clear things need to be seen is to understand the level of performance of the employees in their present job. Who is an excellent performer? Who is an average performer? Who is not contributing? I think one need to identify some of these things. Another is helping people to improve their performance and understand their needs and give them the chance to explore the opportunities within the organization and provide an agenda for personal growth and development. So the why of appraisal when it comes, as we have mentioned in the past, very clearly, A, to improve the performance, B, to initiate personal actions with respect to who is doing and who is not doing and linking that to the reward system. And giving them an opportunity to review their strengths and weaknesses and focus on what needs to be done in the future and certainly linking these information for succession planning and development. From why of appraisal, the next important question one need to explore and understand and answer is when of appraisal. So the question is when this to be done. Ideally, it is linked to the, to the kind of the objectives, the what it is supposed to do. We have, we have said earlier that <coughs> what should be the frequency depends upon the kind of objectives. If it is focusing on the improvement on the job, ideally it is done on a daily basis or as and when some errors are committed, as and when some extraordinary things are done by the individual, the boss should talk to the concerned person, give them as a kind of a feedback and through the feedback, the, the individual gets an idea of what correct things he or she is doing and what is that should be done. The other is the, when you look at for the salary action, when you look at for the movement of people or for personal records then it could move to the once in a year. And in many knowledge-based IT kind of an organization, it is also done once in three months, once in six months. So the question is when more and more you are looking into the improvement of the performance, it should be done weekly or at least once in a month. If it is linked to the review of the work, it could be the end of the project situation or at least could be once in three months. When it is linked to the salary or personal action to be done once in six months or once in a year. But if you are really looking into the career planning, succession planning, at least once in two years. Once in three years for sure. So that is what we are talking about when of the appraisal. So assessment center kind of a method fits in where you can do once in three years. Whereas the bosses should work towards the subordinates work and work behavior, work performance through a method of critical incidents. I think that has to be done daily basis, but at least once in a week or once in a fortnight. Then the question is uh, where of appraisal. Where of appraisal indicates the location. Now where an employee may be evaluated. So it is usually done best in the place of work or the office of the supervisor. Any other place only could create anxiety. But sometimes the assessment center has to be done from away from the work situation. It could be done in uh, company premises or it could be done outside the organization in a, in a place where there is not much of a disturbance and the individuals are free to work and then they are not asked to do any official work or they are not taken out of the assessment procedures. So it is desirable to have such, such situation away from the organization. And when a committee of people have to assess, 
for the purpose of promotion it may be within the office premises or it could be away as well. So, but if it is for a daily basis for that is for a day to day workplace improvement as well as the improving the performance of the individual it is best done in the area where the employee works and the supervisor spends more time with the employee explaining what needs to be done, how better things can be done. The next is in terms of the how which we have listed all through that is essentially the company must decide the question of the methodology, whether it should be based on a simple format, whether simple format or where it includes 7 to 8 or 10 identified dimensions like job knowledge, work method, cooperation, responsibility, many of these things can be put on the left side and are providing a kind of a scale. So, you it could be based on uh, the kind of a formats which people call it as performance appraisal formats or the forms or it could be based on a simple identified time to have a dialogue with the subordinates could be every Monday morning or Monday afternoon kind of a, a structured approaches or it could be a combination of methods depending on what purpose it is. So, but all the things whatever we have mentioned in the past a rating scale, a critical incident, the dialogue and discussion between the boss and subordinates, self appraisal, many of these things do matter as a part of when somebody is thinking about how of performance appraisal. So, but on the basis of this kind of an advantage and the disadvantage, what is workable and what is not workable, one need to decide which method would be the best and uh, what is the best with respect to the stated purpose. I think in the last part we will look into the benefits of the performance appraisal. If you see performance improvement, I think that is the, the greatest of the benefit. The performance feedback allows the employee manager and the personal specialist to intervene with appropriate action to improve the performance. The feedbacks need to be structured, feedback has to be data based and verifiable, feedback need to be much more descriptive not just judgmental and it should provide insights to the individual about what need to be focused on and how the improvement should be brought about. Apart from improving the performance, the next important benefit of the appraisal process is to do the compensation adjustment. It is always desirable that you recognize more those people who are contributing, who are contributing on a consistent basis, consistent basis. Performance evaluation helps decision makers to determine who should receive pay raises. Many managers make that kind of a judgment that these are my star performers, these are my key players, these are my consistent players and similarly they also know that I do not want to have so many people in my department who are not motivated or so and so is not well motivated, so and so is not a team player, so and so is good but not good enough. I think these are all the kind of views which day in and day out the managers express which gets recorded, which gets noted in performance appraisal because that performance evaluation helps in making these compensation adjustments. It is desirable to give more to those people who are contributing and you also create a less or where you do not give much to those people who are not contributing. So, very clearly you induce the required performance through this compensation adjustment. Well linked compensation adjustment schemes to the performance appraisal schemes will always bring better more perceivable benefits. The, the third kind of a benefit to the organization is in terms of placement decisions. The placement decisions are we are talking about promotions to move the individual from a lower level to the next level of responsibility. Normally the higher responsibility would also go with 
higher perks, higher salary, things like that. So, the promotion brings a recognition, it brings more responsibility to the individual and also the transfer. So, the individual is moved from the current task to the some other task, maybe in the related areas and also not so related areas. And these transfers are done both for developmental purposes when you look into as a as a job rotation. Transfer can mean a routine activity as a part of the management of change or the transfer can also mean a punishment where the individual is placed in a play, you know, in a position where he or she may not like to do such things. And demotion is another action where somebody is failing consistently and not able to meet those anticipated performance. And that is the time where you push the individual to a lesser role or lesser responsibility or in the organizational hierarchy, they are also moved from one level to the lower level. I think that is the idea of this demotion. The benefits of performance appraisal if you see further, appraisal data can be used to monitor the success of the organizational recruitment induction practices. So, whenever you see the individuals are able to learn and contribute from the day one or at the earliest, that means the appraisal will talk, is talking about the success of the good HR practices in terms of recruitment, placement and induction. If people are taking more time, if people are not able to show some extraordinary performance, that means you are not able to attract some good talent. You have not or you are not so successful in transform, you know, transforming the talent to give good contribution uh, to the organization. So, performance appraisal gives some fair idea about how good the HR practices in terms of the talent attraction and as well as the initial training to ramp up the abilities and capacities to meet the organizational expectations. Appraisal data, if you see, is also used to monitor the effectiveness of the changes in the recruitment strategy, particularly when you have reduced some of the performance levels or you have increased the performance level. So, the such changes can also be mapped in terms of whether some of those practices are bringing better appraisal, better performance kind of a thing. So, then you can see whether the existing performers are, are uh, coming because of the higher cutoff points or lower cutoff points. And by following the data, one can always see what should be the kind of basis or what from where you must get your people and always our appraisal data can help you to correct the workforce planning and recruitment uh, practices and also make sure that whether you are able to attract the right talents. Another important dimension of the performance appraisal is the training and development uh, needs. So, it is particularly when you identify the poor, poor, poor performers, they can be identified for the retraining. So, it is in the skills or in terms of the attitudes, they, they can also be sent beyond training for counseling, coaching and good performers also can be sent for the mentoring and kind of a thing. And as you see this, the the appraisal discussions, the employee with the employees and thinking about their performance would also highlight many of the you know many of the obvious things and it is important to see what is happening habitually the uh, the idea of uh, training them. So, the question is you do not have to go for training, but do other methods of correction. Performance appraisal can also make the need for training more pressing and relevant and also justify the the, you know, the training budgets. 
to the performance outcome and the future career aspirations always need to be understood. And that is how other benefits certainly includes the career planning and development. The performance feedback guides the career decisions or for the individual to choose appropriate career goals and work hard towards you know, achieving those career goals as a part of one's career path. And the immediate managers do play a big role because they are the ones responsible for the performance. They have also analyzed the performance and through performance appraisal, they have come to some judgment and when they share these things, they are in a position to provide better insights to the individual to help the help them to focus on what needs to be done. Another for our benefit one can see is the motivation and satisfaction. Performance appraisal in some organizations do bring anxiety, do bring uh, a kind of a stress, but on the other side, performance appraisal can also have a profound effect where it, it helps them to see the new reality. It helps them to refocus their effort and makes them to do things better. So the motivation and satisfaction is another important use of the performance appraisal process. And it also provides a recognition for the kind of work efforts they put in and then the, the power of social recognition you see has always been the most useful and more and people recognize that as an incentive. And the, there is a clear evidence that the, the human beings, they prefer negative recognition in preference to no recognition at all. That means if somebody is coming and telling them that you have done a great job, somebody is also telling that you should have done better. I think people like both of these things compared to that nobody is bothering about them. I think that means they are not recognized as a member of the organization. And I think let's uh, you know, look at quickly some of the common mistakes. The performance appraisal, you know, where it fails, you know, the lack of support from the top levels of the management usually is cited as a major contributing reason. So that means individual managers are not supported in doing some right things. When they recommend some good talents, they are not recognized or rewarded. Or when they say that so-and-so is not contributing well, no action is initiated by the top or no action is allowed to be taken at the middle level or the, their own level, then you run into issue. Sometimes it is also political where people don't want to have and they have a disbelief in the effectiveness of the appraisal process. They believe that nothing could happen. So it is important that the top management create a value of the appraisal and then they must show the visible commitment to it. Some other problems are the fear of failure. There is a suspicion amongst the appraisers that a poor appraisal would result in badly and so they would like to hide. They don't want to be open and they want to be away from the supervisors. And uh, appraisers also have a vested interest in making their subordinates look good on paper. So no doubt they are not contributing, but they go out of the way to, and sometimes they have judgment aversion. They are not in a position to decide who is good and who is not so good. So they want to play safe with their subordinates. And they don't want to give a negative uh, appraisal. So there is a problem of this kind of a midpoint reading. So it is in the, you know, what we are talking about is when you are doing the self auditing, it is imp important that people recognize some of these problems. Otherwise, it will come as, come as a bigger issue. Further, the appraisal's preparation is also important, that they must know whom, what is that they are examining and whom they are talking to, these kind of preparations also would help in doing things better. 
Employee participation is another important dimension. It is where the employees do get an opportunity to express and a mutual agreement is a key to success. And performance management when it is not linked to the rewards and not linked to the various other activities, if it is only an isolated practice, it becomes useless. And what is important is to do a thing in an integrated fashion. We have seen so far the methods of the appraisal, the components of the appraisal process, the benefits and some of the common mistakes done by the appraisers. What we will do in the next session is to look at a, the concept and definition and methods of training and development. Thank you.